<laughs> Welcome, Brother Shane. Well, I'm invite you to open back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is a familiar passage if you've been in church, especially if you've been here with us, as we um, partake of the Lord's Supper. We try to explain um, as we partake together. But today I thought it would be fitting if we go back to this text, and I want to actually teach through this text again. And let me just say right off the bat here, we're only going to look at four really um, key points, if you would, in these uh, in these verses. There are many other things that we could say about the Lord's Supper. There are several things that you may want to know more about, and you can study more about it, or maybe we'll come back to this passage in the days ahead and uh, study it a little more uh, in-depthly. But you could also ask after church here if you have a specific question be glad to try to answer it if i know the answer to that tyler i may not know the answer or whoever it might be um but i'll do what i can and uh, i'm not the omniscient one that's the lord god uh but um there are four key things that i want us to focus on today as the body of christ as we come to the table and that is the the title for our time together today and really our focus today and it should be our focus every time we come to the lord's table and so in chapter 11, I want to begin really at verse 17. We're going to kind of back up and take um, several verses here. But I want to go through these four key points. And if you have a, a handout, I'd encourage you just to follow along, just to help you to remember some of these things. Some of you have minds that are like steel traps, and you don't need to do this. But I have to see it, hear it, and write it down so that it gets into this thick skull of mine. So I take the opportunity to do the very thing I'm asking you to do here if you're able to to jot a few notes down, but the first thing I want us to see in this passage is that the Lord's Supper is something unique. In fact, it's designed to be observed by the church assembled together, assembled together. And I know different folks historically have had different practices for the Lord's Supper, and uh, there have been folks that partake of the Lord's Supper to get, uh, uh, alone at their home, and um, alone and together, those things don't really go together. Uh, and we'll see what I mean by that here in just a moment. But it has been designed by the Lord himself to be observed together. I want you to look at verse 17 for a moment. In fact, there's five different verses here I want to just draw your attention to very briefly. But in verse 17, I want you to notice a few words that begin to jump out. In giving this instruction, I do not praise you. Now remember, Paul is writing to a church, a local church in the town of Corinth. He's writing to believers, and this was a very carnal body. Uh, Corinth was uh, a hotbed of idolatry. Um, there was uh, a pantheon of gods in this area that had, were worshipped at this time. And part of the cultural worship of their pagan gods that they believed in, part of that involved temple prostitution and along with that some other things, right? But, but this was rampant in this region. And so Paul wrote this first letter to the Corinthian church to address a lot of very carnal sins that had crept into the church. And so he's writing some correction, and much of that correction has taken place already. But now he comes to a part that he's going to really hone in on this idea of coming to the table together. And he's going to begin to address some specifics that have harmed their coming together to observe this ideal of communion in the Lord's Supper. So he says, in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better but for the worse. So what they were doing in coming together was right, but the specifics of what they were doing as they came together, there were some things that they were doing wrongly. And that's where he's going to begin to address, and we'll look at some of those things. But look at the next verse, verse 18. For in the first place, when you come together, there's that phrase again, so it's together, the body together. When you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. Now we're going to come back to this ideal specifically and talk about the necessity of certain types of division in the church. I know that sounds odd, but there is a reason for there to be some godly type division in the church. But look at verse 20. Let's just keep this ideal going here. Therefore, when you meet, what's the word? Together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Something else had overtaken their time of observation of communion. Look at verse 33. We're going to skip down a bit, but look at verse 33. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. We always say that when we give instruction. 
will pass our our men will come forward here in a few moments and they'll they'll pass the the elements of the body and the and the the blood right the bread and the the juice and and we'll ask you to wait and to hold it in your hand and and wait till everyone is served so that we can partake together that comes from this text but look at the next verse verse 34 this one is taken in a negative sense but it's the same idea if anyone is hungry let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment so again He's going to tell them something negative. They're doing this wrongly, but in coming together is still in view here. You will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I'll arrange or address when I come. And so he's speaking to them as a body. Now, in the body of believers are individual Christians. We all make up the body together. And as we go through this text this morning, you're going to notice that sometimes he's going to say you singularly, meaning each one of us, but then other times he's going to say you collectively, meaning us all together as a whole. And it's kind of lost somewhat in our English language, but, but the ideal is that the people individually all together make up the body singular. Does that make sense? All of us together are different people, but we are one body together. And there are certain things that each one of us as people, as Christians, we have to deal with between just us and the Lord. We have to make right our own sin for ourselves. I can't fix your sin for you. You can't fix my sin for me, but we can come together and encourage one another and, and call one another to accountability. That's something we do together. But each of us has a role to play as Christians singularly between us and the Lord, and then collectively as the body of Christ for the Lord. Amen? And so both of these ideals are going to come out today. But what we see here is that the observation of the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated. Communion is to be celebrated by the assembled church. In fact, the very word for church, in fact, there are two key words that are used in the New Testament. One is the predominant word and that's the word we find here uh, ecclesia is how we typically say it ecclesia um, but this idea of ecclesia it, it's, it's kind of a, a two sided coin if you will it typically is used in the sense of the called out ones the ideal is that we're called out of the world into the body of Christ and that's the other side of the coin we're called out together as one and both of those ideals are in view whenever we talk when the Bible talks about the ecclesia the called out ones. Now, this was a, a very common Greek word in this culture in the first century. The called out ones, the ecclesia, um, the Septuagint even translates a lot of words from the Old Testament or several words in the Old Testament as ecclesia. The Septuagint being the Greek translation of the Old Testament text uh, done about 270 BC. And uh, uh, they use this ideal ecclesia. It was used prolifically in this uh, ancient world. Uh, to talk about assembled bodies, assembled groups of people, not just the church, not just Israel in the Old Testament. But by the time of the apostles, this word began to fall out of favor for anything other than speaking of the body of Christ. In fact, by the second century, you, you rarely see it. And after the third century, it's really just fallen out of favor completely from the, the typical Greek usage, the, the koine, koinea. Um, that just that, uh, excuse me, that Koine Greek, that common Greek language. And, and it just wasn't used unless it was talking about the church. The church was such that they really stole the usage of this word, um, ecclesia. The church was the called out ones, called together to be the body of Christ. And so it's made for us to be together. In fact, if you look at verse 18 again, when you come together, that's plural. When you all that's how we would say it here, right? You all or y'all. When y'all come together, that would be the, the um, I guess, the first southern translation of Scripture, right? But when you all, when y'all come together, verse 19 is the same thing. Therefore, when you all meet together or when y'all meet together, verse 20, the same thing. When you all meet together, and then again in verse 22, we see it again. There's the plural idea. It's meant to be celebrated together. Now, I know I um, uh, had a wedding yesterday. Uh, uh, there was a, The last two weeks there have been weddings. I missed Vivian and Kyle's wedding. Uh, my wife had to get sick, right, and uh, uh, didn't get to partake of that. Um, my loss, I know, um, but beautiful wedding from what I was able to see on the live stream. So glad y'all were able to do that. Um, 
it, just wonderful. And the ideal of a, a marriage is just a beautiful testament to Christ and his body, the church. Amen? And that's the way it's designed. And, and uh, Josh, your, your pastor friend, did a tremendous job. That was a beautiful ceremony. Uh, and then yesterday, uh, Macy's best friend, Rebecca, uh, got married um, to uh, uh, Jacob Gerstenberg. And uh, uh, so David Turner did their wedding. Again, just a beautiful beautiful ceremony just again just a, a testament a, a, a beautiful picture of christ and his body the church it's just beautiful how he designed a man and a woman to go together just like that isn't that strange it's almost as if god knew what he was doing when he created us male and female amen just had to throw that out there and um uh, but in, in, in seeing that yesterday, in, in getting to, to observe and, and to, to celebrate this ideal of the, the coming together, I was watching, uh, I know at uh, Vivian and Kyle's wedding, they, instead of doing like probably most of us if we've been married for 20 plus years, uh, we all did the unity candle. Remember the unity candle? The ideal, the two flames become one. How many of you did the unity candle kind of thing? All right, so a lot, a lot of us did. That was kind of kind of the thing to do some people did the sand where you pour two different colors of sand anybody do the sand for their coming to know that one okay not very many of you uh some did the cord where you knot the cord together uh you take the cord of three strands and you weave it together one for each person in the marriage right the man the woman and then one for the lord and you knot them together and that cord of three strands is not easily broken anybody do the strands in their wedding no all right what else did y'all do Nothing. There you go. Nothing. Thank you, Miss Clara. Yeah, what did y'all do? Nothing. We just got married. That's the important part, and she's right about that. And so different folks have done different sort of things. Vivian and Kyle signed a family Bible. They had their families sign, and then they signed the Bible together during that time. I think that's what y'all were doing, right? Or y'all reading maybe what they wrote and going, well, I'm going to get him for that or, or something. Maybe I don't know, but, but you signed it together. I thought that was, a, that was new to me. That was a really nice thing. Some people have even, and, and I've done this for couples, uh, some people, the bride and groom will partake of communion together, like their first communion, and I've seen that. And let me just say, I used to think that was a beautiful thing. But the more I've grown in the Word, the more I've come to understand that we might actually do harm when we do that thing at a wedding. Now, nothing, again, I did it for folks in the past. So, not trying to chastise anyone here, but the ideal of the communion is not something that we watch other people do. The ideal of the communion is something that we as the body of Christ do together. And I think the danger in like a ceremony like that is that some people become spectators while someone else partakes of communion together and the ideal is lost that we are together that we do it assembled together and so that's just my, my only kind of rub about doing it in marriages going forward now we come together it's plural each of us making up the body of christ together and so we do this we come to the lord's supper and and in coming together it does something the second thing that it does is it it, it helps us it's it's really like this this instrument this tool for us to help us grow not just with the lord which is super important amen but it helps us to grow with one another as well and so we're able to grow in our relationship with christ and one another and the Lord's Supper is not just a ceremony to, to, to remember what Christ has done. It is that, but it's more than that. It's an instrument to grow in your relationship with Christ. Look at verse 17 again. He says, you're doing this wrongly. You've messed up. You've lost the way. And so I can't praise you in this. And he's going to go on to explain to them why. He says, when you come together, verse 18, I hear there are divisions among you. We're going to come back to that, that idea. But they're doing things wrong. And they were eating. In fact, in the first century, there's good evidence that oftentimes when the church came together for the Lord's Supper, they would partake together of what's known now as a love feast. The love feast was not the Lord's Supper. The love feast would be the equivalent of what we would call um, the potluck supper, I guess, today, right? Or, or, or Wednesday night supper, something like that, where we all come together, we bring stuff, and we all eat together. And so at the love feast, they would do that, and it began to where they would do so, waiting for everyone to come, and then sharing together of all of the goods that came, just like we do at our Wednesday night meals. You don't just cook for yourself, you cook for everyone together and we all share that meal together 
And when there's bacon, it's even better, right? But we all share those things together. But what had happened was they weren't waiting on others to get there. And so he's going to chastise them and correct them in their, um, in their arrogance, in their, their pride, in their selfishness, right? In their, in their uh, insecurity, in their lack of one anothering. And so the ideal is going to... Gonna, we're going to see here is that, that they weren't growing together. They were selfishly indulging. In fact, he's going to say some of you are, are eating like gluttons. Some of you are getting drunk. You're, you're, not even, you're, you're not even there consciously now by the time we actually get to the Lord's Supper. You're already gone. You've already just been a glutton and a drunkard, and, and you have no idea of what is fixing to take place because the Lord's Supper would have been brought together at the end. And so he's going to correct them. But the correction is so that they will grow together. He wants them to grow. And that's, that's why, folks, listen, church discipline, as unpopular as it is, um, please know that it's one of the most loving things a church can do. Amen? Church discipline is because of love. We come to one another out of love to help correct one another, to, to bear with one another, to encourage, to spur one another on. And, and in this regard... What Paul is doing here in this instruction is he's disciplining the body of Christ so that they will grow in their walk with Christ and, as a result, with one another. But you think about the Lord's Supper. How does it help us to grow together? Well, notice a few things about the instruction here that we see. In fact, really, if you, if you look at verse 23, you'll see where Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night that he was betrayed took bread. So notice a few things that are, 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 are really behind these words. First of all, when Christ was there with him that night, it means that he had to have been born and taken on flesh. Amen? He had to have been born. The eternal God had to be incarnate. He had to take on flesh so that he could come and be present with them in this fashion. And he's going to go on to explain that the bread and the wine, they represent the atoning death of Jesus Christ. So he had to have been born. There's the virgin birth. There's doctrine. We're growing our understanding of who God is. There's a sinless life because he's the sinless, perfect sacrifice. That's in view in the Lord's Supper as well. And then, obviously, again, his spilt blood, his shed blood, shed for the remission of our sins. All of these things come together in the Lord's Supper. And oftentimes, we just hurry through it, it seems, sometimes. Not here so much, but in the past, I know I have. It's something you just kind of tack on at the end of a service, and, and you try to get through it. And then you wrestle with, should we do announcements after? Will that make it unspiritual? Or, you know, how should we leave? And, and, it, and it seems to be just another piece. Folks, the Lord's Supper is, is a place where we stop, where we put on the brakes and we remember Jesus. It helps us to grow. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is, again, instructing the church in verses um, 3 through 6 particularly. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance, Protoss, the, the priority thing here. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're observing the fact that the sinless Lamb of God, amen, died for our sins. And it wasn't uh, God's plan B. It wasn't that he said, uh-oh, these people just aren't getting it. I guess we better come up with another plan. And, okay, Jesus, you're going to go and die for these people. This was the plan in eternity past, according to Scriptures. This had been prophesied and established before the foundation of the world. Amen? Ephesians chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us before there was anything that Jesus was the plan. He was always the plan. And so Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Verse 4, he was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas. That's Peter. Then to the twelve. After that, to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Again, when Paul's given this testimony, when his, this, this, this declaration of the gospel is being presented, the witnesses to this, even the enemies of Christ, were still alive, most of them, though some had fallen asleep, meaning some had died. But the gospel is the central piece of the Lord's Supper. And folks, the gospel is the central piece, not just to how you were saved, Christian, but how God sanctifies us still today. It's the gospel that does that. It's the gospel that calls us to repentance. It's all gospel. The atoning death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all in view in the Lord's Supper. It's all here. It's all a part of it. 
Look at verse 26, back to 1 Corinthians 11. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Do you understand? The focus is on that sacrificial sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's not just something we do. It is something we do, but it's not just something we do. It's something we do to remember what Jesus has done for us. Amen? And it's important for us to do so. And the Bible never tells us how often to do so. We labor over that and try to prayerfully consider, you know, do we do it too often to where that it's just a habit? Do we not do it often enough? And, and it's hard to find balance. And different churches have different practices of doing that. But the Scripture just says as often as you do it. It doesn't tell us how often we have to do it. But folks, when we do it, all the essence of the gospel is there in the observation of the Lord's Supper. When we partake together, we are observing that Christ came and lived a sinless life. The virgin birth of Christ. He's the sinless Savior. We're, we're identifying the fact that he lived a sinless life and he died on the cross to pay for sin. Not his own because he was perfect, but our sin. He was the spotless lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And he was dead, buried, and raised to life on the third day. And he's coming again. Look at verse 26 again. How often do we do this? Until he comes. So if he's coming again, he had to have come the first time. I mean, all of the doctrines that are important here, right? All of the crucial Christian doctrines are seen here in the observation of the Lord's Supper. It's not just something we add on. It's something that we do for Christ, to remember Christ, to grow in Christ, and to grow with one another. Which brings us to this third ideal here. The Lord's Supper teaches us that there will be divisions in our church, but necessary divisions. You see, there are wrong divisions, and we absolutely must fight against those kind of things. And, and it means we have to die to ourselves and prefer one another above ourselves. And in fact, uh, not this Wednesday, but the following week, Lord willing, we're going to begin looking at um, some one anothering. Okay, we're going we're gonna, to, once again, it's been about eight years, I think, since we've done this. But we're going to go back through, and uh, starting in Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at the fact that God planned and perfectly set up a, a system he gave some as apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and, and evangelists in order to grow his church. We're going to see that, but then we're going to see how the church grows by one another. And we're going to see all of this, how it ties together. We need one another. And therefore, we have to fight against worldly divisions. There's no reason, no place for selfishness and pride and ego and uh, this is mine and that's yours and don't touch that. Don't sit here. You know, some churches um, I've seen, oh, it's, it's so horrifying. Someone actually comes in and sits down, and this happened in a pew, and someone else walked up and said, oh, you must be new here because you're in my spot. And they weren't smiling. They weren't joking. They actually made the people move. Now, guess where they moved to? Another seat? Mm -mm. They moved right out the door, right out the door. Folks, I'm so grateful that's never happened here. It's never happened here. Amen? All right. And it should never happen here. Amen. There you go. Now you're, you're catching up with the sign language here. I'm cueing you there for that. But it should never happen. But there are necessary divisions, Paul says. And this is a little confusing. But in light of the entirety of this letter, as we begin to see, even reading into 2 Corinthians, but, but specifically here in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about sin and how the church must stand against sin and expel the immoral brothers who refuse to repent. That's a necessary part of church discipline. But here, the ideal is necessary divisions. Look at verses 18 and 19. He says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. Now, if we stopped right there, we would say, That should not be, there should not be divisions. But then he throws this in there. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. So, so sinfulness has to be judged. It has to be dealt with so that the pure bride, the pure body of Christ can be identified. And folks, this is not happening in America today for the whole. As for the big picture, most of our churches today are not practicing um, this self-discipline of church discipline and of, of expelling sin. In fact, sadly, more and more churches are embracing secularism, embracing humanism, and embracing just blatant sin. We're, we're legalizing now the very sins that, that the Scriptures prohibit for believers. Many church 
churches. In fact, many entire denominations of churches have fallen by the wayside by embracing just blatant sin. Folks, may that never be for us, amen? May that never be. But if a brother or sister is caught in sin, we who are spiritual are to go to them and do what? Rebuke them. Judge them harshly. No, that's what our flesh wants to do oftentimes. But we who are spiritual go to them in an effort to restore them. We pray with them. We help them. We hold them accountable. We walk with them. We help to hold them accountable to God's word and to the Lord himself. And so, so we do that, but there should never be worldly division. The division that is in view here, as you look at the entirety of 1 Corinthians, is the division between light and darkness. As he's identifying sin in the body, he's saying that can't be. The church is light. And you'll know from our study of 1 John that God is light, and in him there is how much darkness? None at all. There's none at all. And that's the design for his bride. He wants us to be pure and holy. Now, obviously, while we're still entangled with this flesh, this corrupted flesh, this fallen body that we walk around in, obviously, we still wrestle with sin. But sin is a way of life, and we're going to come back to this ideal next week when we pick back up in 1 John chapter 3. Sin as a practice, as a way of life daily for a Christian, is not to be. It just can't be for a true Christian, a daily habitual turning from the Lord. There's, a, there's something that rubs there, and we have to deal with that. And so this ideal is that for the church, what we need to do, what Paul is really encouraging the body to do here, is to do the very thing that Martin Luther did in his day when the church, when Romanism had taken over the church universally as a whole, not every church, but uh, I said as a whole, but I mean predominantly. Uh, Roman Catholicism beginning... Um, the, the, the birth pains were there in about the 4th century, out of the end of the 3rd into the 4th century, but by the 6th century, it was in full-blown Roman, Romanistic mode, and uh, it just continued uh, to be more paganized thereafter. But there was always a remnant of the true church. Um, there were groups. Um, Luther came out of the Roman Catholic Church. There, was, there were the Calvins. There were the Knoxes. There were all sorts of folks that were still staying true as best they could to the Word of God. There was always a remnant. Um, uh, Peter Valdo and the Waldensian movement, there was always a remnant of the true church that continued throughout uh, history. And we're grateful for that continuity. Amen? But we need to be the way he was in that day, realizing that popes can err, and they do. Councils err, and they have, and they still will. Churches err, sadly, even still today. But what Luther said was that his conscience, he said, quote, my conscience is held captive to the word of God, end quote. And folks, that is what we judge ourselves with. Amen? God's Word. And so we must consider then, as he says, some of these factions are necessary. We need to make sure that we're judging ourselves first and foremost according to Scripture. And then we judge our body as a whole according to the Scripture so that light can be separated from darkness. That is the, the division that Paul has in view here. It's the same idea that we pick up on in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. We see this in the Lord's teaching. He says, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. You see, the Lord's Supper is an opportunity for us to grow, not just with Christ, but to grow with one another as we examine ourselves. And this is why we don't ever just surprise you with the Lord's Supper. You don't just show up one day and, surprise, we're having the Lord's Supper. Now, you could have missed uh, an email or a Facebook post or a sign up front, or you could have missed it in the bulletin. But, you know, we're trying to let people know at least a week or two in advance before the Lord's Supper so that you and I all have the opportunity, because it's our responsibility, to make sure that as far as we're concerned, we're right with those people around us that we serve with. It's a big deal. That's why this instruction is given. That's why um, the same spirit here is, is in view when Jesus says, if you have a, a, a something against a brother, or they have something against you, rather, uh, you leave your offering. You don't go to the altar. You make things right first. Relationships are important in the church, amen? And so we're to make things right as far as we can. Can we force people to be right with us? No. 
No. I mean, I wish we could. I mean, then that way I'd always have my way. <laughs> and that's great for me, <laughs> but it's not good for anybody else. We can't force people to respond certain ways. We can't force them to, and that was just a joke, by the way. I don't demand my way. You, you know that was just a joke. But, but we, as far as we're concerned, we need to do all that we can to make things right between ourselves and our brother. That means we've sought forgiveness. We've tried to restore the relationship. We're, we're doing what's necessary as far as we know to make things okay. But then it's up to them and the Lord to, to finish the process. But, but as far as we're concerned, before we come to the table, we need to prayerfully consider, are we good with Christ? Are we good with our brothers and our sisters in Christ? Well, you're, you sound like we have to be perfect to come to the Lord's Supper. Folks, please know that's not at all what I'm saying, which brings us to number four. We are to come in a manner worthy to this table together. But folks, hear me and hear me good. None of us are worthy apart from Christ. And none of us Christians are worthy in our own efforts, in our own doing. We're only worthy because of Christ, amen? We're only worthy because of what he has done for us. And folks, this table was implemented. The Lord's Supper was designed for an imperfect people. And all God's imperfect people say, amen, because we are not yet glorified. One day we will be. We will know as we're known. One day we'll be glorified. Sin will have no more hold on us. But until that day, we're being made holy. We're being made more holy every single moment of every single day. And every sickness, every healthy day, every, um, every um, everything in, in our day-to-day -day living is an opportunity for us to grow and to be more sanctified. Every relationship can be iron that sharpens us. And every, every, um, every snag, every snafu, every, um, every, every pileup on the interstate, every time your car breaks down coming back from your honeymoon, whatever it might be, all of these things are used by God to either make us more sanctified, right? That's what they're, they should make us more sanctified. Or if we're in our flesh in those moments, they can make us less like Christ. But folks, take the opportunity. And so, so we come in a worthy manner, which means we only come through Christ. None of us are perfect in and of ourselves. None of us. Myself, uh, I, I, you know, there are days when I think that there's going to be like an arm wrestling, you know, contest in heaven. You know, Paul called himself um, the least of the apostles. And I, and I just love the humility as he grew. Remember, he was the least of the apostles early on. And then he was the, the, uh, the least of the saints, right the least of all saints and then as he matured at the end of his life he called himself the chief of all sinners that's that's humility i mean the pride was was vanquished from his life as he grew and grew in the lord from the from the from the least of the apostles the least of the saints to the chief of all sinners and, but but some days i don't know about you but some days tim i, I feel like i'm, I'm going to get to heaven and i'm going to say all right paul i'm going to we're going to arm wrestle now for the title of chief of sinners do you ever feel that way you ever feel like you're the worst person on the face of the planet? Huh? I mean, there's just days that it hits you where you just realize, oh, how gracious you've been with me, God. I am such a sinner, such a sinner. Oh, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that it extends beyond my stupidity and my selfish pride. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Do you ever have those moments? Folks, you know what that, you know what that says? That says that you are worthy to come to the table. Because to be worthy to come to the table is to recognize the fact that it's only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's only because of the gospel message of Jesus Christ that we're able to come in this manner. And so we come prepared with the word. With the word of God, we, we use the word of God to, to judge ourselves. It's easy to judge other people and what they're doing wrong, but we judge ourselves, amen, and see where our our sin is 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 in error, and, and all of our sin is in error, but where we have fallen short of God's glorious standard. We use this word. We come prepared with prayer. We ask God to reveal to us any hidden sin that we could confess it and let go of it, and, and we ask God to, to be the strength of our life, to be the strength of our heart, to be our banner, our shield, to protect us, to, to um, ensure that victory over this area of, of sinfulness in our walk. We ask for accountability, and we, we pray with others that they would hold us accountable. We want another together that we would be all that God wants us to be. And in doing so, we're able to come, therefore, prepared with a heart for Jesus. 
A lot of you know uh, J.C. Ryle. He was, he was that old Anglican bishop years and years and years ago fighting against the, the liberalism that had crept into the Anglican church in his day and continues to this day, sadly. But J.C. Ryle was, was, um, was a light in a very dark time. And uh, he, he says this. He says, quotes, Are we in the habit of coming to the Lord's table? If so, in what frame of mind do we come? Do we draw near intelligently, humbly, and with faith? Do we understand what we are doing? Do we really feel our sinfulness and need of Christ? Do we really desire to live a Christian life as well as profess the Christian faith? Happy is that soul who can give a satisfactory answer to these questions. Let him go forward and persevere, end quote. Folks, that just grabs hold of me and makes me, makes me come back and, and look. Do I come near to this table intelligently? Am I thinking about it, or is this just a habit that I'm used to doing? Am I really thinking and considering what is involved when I come before this table together? Am I coming humbly, or do I deserve all of this? Do I, do I stand up like the Pharisees and say, Oh, Lord, and pray so that all can hear me? Do I, do I take my juice and my bread in such a way that every eye is on me? Or am I humble? And thinking, oh, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. I don't deserve this, but I come in this fashion because you are worthy, oh, God. And your worth has been imputed. Your righteousness has been imputed to me. Do I come with faith, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? That it's by grace, through faith in Jesus alone, that we're able to stand before Christ. Amen? It's only that way. There's nothing in us. What does Isaiah say? Our, filthy, our, our, our righteous deeds are what? Filthy rags? Got tongue twisted and let the, let the answer out for you. But, but all of our righteous deeds are, are, are filthy, discarded rags. That's the best we have to offer. But Christ makes us worthy. Do I understand what I'm doing? This doesn't literally turn into his body. I'm not re-sacrificing Jesus as some wrongly teach over and over and over again. That would be, that would be um, unscriptural, first of all, which is the main thing. But do you realize if we were literally eating the body and, the, uh, uh, and drinking the blood of Christ, we would be vampires or cannibals? <laughs> do you understand that's wrong? That is not what's in view here. It's a symbol. It's to remind us of the one and only sacrifice of Jesus. Sufficient, fully, completely sufficient to take care of our sin debt. So am I thinking about what Christ has done? Do I feel the weight of my sin and my need for Christ? feel that weight, that burden. Folks, thank God when you're convicted of your sin. Thank God that you're convicted. Thank, I, I do. I thank God that you're convicted of your sin. But folks, more so, I thank God that I'm convicted of my sin. I know that His Spirit dwells within me when His Spirit convicts me. Amen? That gives me hope that He's not done with me yet. It reminds me of First John, that He who began a good work in me will not, what? He'll not fail to complete that work, but He'll bring it to completion. Oh, thank God for that. Amen? Am I living this life? I mean, is my desire, is my goal when I get up to live the crucified life, to live the Christian life, to walk with Christ? Or do I hit the ground running, thinking about all my stuff and all my doings and what's going to happen, what I've got to do, and who's going to do for me? Or, or, or am I living in such a way that, that it's, God, how can I serve you and others today? Before our feet hit the ground, where's our mind? Are we, are we desiring to walk with Christ? Do we profess the Christian faith? And folks, I think that we're living in such a time that this is not, that, that here in America, I don't think there's ever been a time where this, is, this has been harder than it's, than it's beginning to be today. I mean, there have always been pockets of persecution. The rest of the world has been enduring persecution for centuries now. But I think for the first time in America, I think we're really beginning to get a sense of what persecution is going to be like. And if we can't profess Christ now, there is no way we will profess Christ when the heat really gets turned up. Do you love Jesus? Are you walking with Jesus today? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me for a moment. And as we begin just with this attitude of prayer, let me just read to you one other quote here. This is from James Montgomery Boyce. He says, At the heart of the present significance of the Lord's Supper is our communion or fellowship with Christ, hence the term communion service. 
In coming to this service, the believer comes to meet with Christ and have fellowship with him at his invitation. The examination takes place because it would be hypocrisy for us to pretend that we are in communion with the Holy One while actually cherishing known sin in our heart. Folks, do you understand the significance of those statements? Are you and I cherishing known sin? Are we harboring sin in our hearts? Folks, that makes us unworthy. But Christ calls us. He calls us as his children to be worthy. And in doing so, he calls us to repent of our sin. So, beloved, would you take a few moments and examine yourself, even here this morning now? Would you examine your heart as our, as our men come forward who have been selected this week to help distribute the elements? I pray that you would continually, just prayerfully examining your heart, your walk, your life, and if the Lord reveals any sin therein, would you confess that sin to the Lord?